Hey, um, I know I was gonna do this later, but might as well get it done and out of the way early because uh, I don't really have any other reason. I gotta do a reading later, which is gonna take up some time in my life. So, um, all right, <laughs> story time with Liz. I'm joking. No, but I am going to tell a story, and it's something that's very personal. It was very traumatic to me, and probably a lot of other people that were involved in the situation. Um, God, my heart's racing right now. <laughs> um, but I want to discuss uh, losing a child. Now, a lot of people walk around, and you don't realize that they've lost anything you don't realize that they've suffered anything you don't realize that really anything is happening but today is the day that my daughter would have been turning well yesterday she would have been turning 16 today is make 16 years that she's crossed over and I know looking at me you're like no way in hell but yes <laughs> Um, you know, and it's difficult. It's difficult because of the situation, the way it happened, everything. So I'm going to start at the beginning and just kind of tell you a story about how everything played out. So I was in the military. I think at the time I was living in Japan and I had found out I was pregnant. So I was 18, you know, I was... 18 years old when I found out I was pregnant and I was scared shitless like scared scared because I never wanted kids and I didn't know what type of a mom I would be or any combination so I cried a lot anytime anyone even mentioned me being pregnant I started crying hysterically so in the moving past all of that um, you know the relationship I had with my daughter's father was in my mind great you know i was in love i was happily committed it was awesome so a few months about four months you know you go for blood work ultrasound all of that stuff uh my results were not normal so i ended up having to go to a hospital in japan somewhere to have a very uh high risk I think ultrasound is what they call it but I went and I had that done so in having this ultrasound um, you know like I could see the dread on the doctor's face when I walked into the room and I was with my daughter's father and I'm just sitting there like anxious because one I'd never been pregnant before and I never had an ultrasound and I didn't know what was happening so I was afraid and and being afraid I didn't know I just didn't know what to expect so when I walk into the room you know she's we're sitting down I'm sitting on the hospital bed and the doctor is going over the ultrasound and she's showing me what's going on and what's wrong with the baby and you know, she starts going over the images and she's showing me, she's focusing on the baby's head. Now, in focusing on the baby's head, it was not, um, it didn't fully form, it didn't fully close. So when that happened, it was, it is called an encephaly. It is a neural tube defect where you don't have enough folic acid and in the first, I believe, five or six weeks, everything is closed up. You know, it also contributes to spina bifida, but everything's supposed to be sealed. You know, the brain, all of that, the stem cell, all of that closes and it didn't close. So it was still open. So basically, they're telling me that my daughter wasn't going to live, you know. And at that moment, I just cried. And I cried probably more than I ever cried in my fucking existence. And I cried for the whole day. Um, because I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. You know, I'm 18, barely starting my life. 
fucking in a foreign country away from everybody that I know my family I'm alone so you know I go back to my barracks I'm in my room and they don't send anyone to keep an eye on me or to stay with me or anything they just send me in my room you know I'm a SIQ sick in quarters and I'm just there crying and I'm sad and I'm depressed and I'm all these things because I don't know what the fuck to do now so I'm sure at some point I had called my mom you know and I had a conversation with her and I was crying and my daughter's father was also you know he was kind of like in shock about it so I decided that I was just going to continue with the pregnancy now this is against my mother telling me to have an abortion the doctors telling me to have an abortion my daughter's father wanting me to have an abortion and I just couldn't do it because for me this is my baby this is a little person that's inside me that I've seen moving I've seen her heartbeat you know and I see all of this so I couldn't do it so I stay in Japan for a few more months and then I request to go back to where my mother is because I knew that I was gonna have to have a service for my daughter you know I, was, I knew what was the outcome was gonna be they've already told me but I wanted to be around my family when it happened because I needed the support I needed that so in between leaving Japan and getting back to the States I find out that the person I'm so in love with and so committed to has a whole nother family you know I knew that he had a girl an ex who was pregnant and was going to be giving birth to his child but he neglected to tell me that he was very much in a relationship with her so I found out while I was going through all this I find out that he's still talking to her he's still calling her he's still doing everything I even had a conversation with her but he told her that I was crazy so when I get back to the States I call her again and she's like I don't understand why you lied and I was like I didn't lie it was like I'm I think I was about six months maybe between six and seven months pregnant and I'm explaining everything to her and I was like you know what um, we'll call him we'll have a three-way conversation so while I was talking to him about the baby and asking him to pray for the baby and everything else the minute he heard her voice he hung up the phone so he already knew he was caught there was no more lying to me no more lying to her no more anything and at that point her and I had built some type of a friendship you know we were cool until it was time for me to give birth now that's we're adding a few more months so now we're saying I'm about nine months pregnant in that time frame my daughter's father, I think, was had, was just coming back to the States. Um, her, his son's birthday was coming up, he, and I was going to be giving birth. And he was telling me that he was not going to be there because he wanted to go to wherever to see his son. And I flipped the fuck out because I was like, one... You don't know how much time your daughter has, and this is going to be the only time you're able to have with her. Your son is in perfect health, so you can see him and be with him at any point in time. So I was like, you better be here. Like, it's not an option. It's not a fucking request. I'm telling you, you better be here. Because at that time, I was just in a bad place, and I didn't give a fuck, and I would have done whatever the fuck I needed to do to make sure shit happened the way I needed it to happen. So he comes and in his coming, I learned that he's still dealing with his ex and he was still dealing with me. So he didn't really change much. But in the process of being pregnant with a baby that you know isn't going to live, it's hard because you have doctors telling you that the baby could just be stillborn and die while it's still inside of you. You have people 
that want to come and rub your belly and ask you, you know, when are you due and what are you having? Because it's supposed to be a happy time. You know, it's, you're celebrating a life. And and you don't want to sit there and explain all these fucking horrible things to people because they're not going to understand. And then they're just going to pity you and feel bad for you. So, I would pretend that everything was okay because I didn't want anyone to pity me or feel bad for me and I didn't really want to have to sit there and explain what was happening with me so all this time passes and the day comes you know and the whole time the doctors are telling me that the baby's not going to know when to come and they're trying to schedule my induction for September 11th and I'm telling them no You know, I ended up going in because my mucus plug was coming out. And as the mucus plug was coming out, I'm like, it felt, started having pains. And they were like, oh, you're going to be going into labor. Now, mind you, they told me this wasn't going to happen. That she wouldn't know, she wouldn't be aware. So, I'm like, fuck. I'm going into labor now. I'm in my mom's house. My daughter's father is there, and I'm terrified to go to the hospital because I know what's going to happen. So I'm from my mom's room, sitting on her bed, having contractions. I'm going to the shower, trying to ease the contractions, and I was in labor for almost 24 hours with my daughter. So I was in a lot of pain, but I was more afraid of going to the hospital. And it was my daughter's father's sister that was a nurse that talked to me and she's like you have to go to the hospital you have a high-risk pregnancy you need to go so at that point I was like fine I'll go and I get to the hospital I'm about six centimeters dilated it is a military hospital so that's a whole shit on itself it was a fucking shit show Um, all of the appointments that I had, all of the preparations that they made, all of the everything that they told me, the team that was supposed to be there for when I gave birth to my daughter because of the situation, nobody was there. Not the doctor that was tending to me, not the team, nobody knew what the fuck to do, nobody knew what was going on. And mind you, I'm only 18, so I don't know what's happening. I've never been pregnant, I've never had a kid, I've never anything. So my mom's there. She's had a few drinks because <laughs> she's dressed the fuck out. <clears throat> you know, it affected her greatly knowing that her first granddaughter she was going to lose. So, all this, I'm in the hospital. And the doctors are telling me they don't know if they can give me an epidural. They don't know, like, all this shit. And my mom starts flipping the fuck out. <laughs> Because that's my mom. Like she would, she didn't give a fuck. She's flipping the fuck out. She was a tiny woman. She was smaller than I. So she was sitting there and she started cursing the doctors out and told them that they needed to give me the epidural. So they gave me the epidural. Zayel. So they gave me the epidural, and at that point, um, you know, it eased my pain a little bit. But I was already, like, ready to push her out by the time I got to the hospital. You know, I only had a few more centimeters to go. So, and again, the doctors told me that the baby wouldn't cry when I gave birth to her. So I was just happy that she came out alive. I was happy that I would be able to see her and meet her and hold her. Now... When I heard her cry, because immediately after I gave birth to her, you know, usually they put the baby on your chest. That didn't happen. They took her. They immediately took her to another area, you know, to clean her up and, like, uh, cover her head and stuff. But I heard her cry. She cried two times, and I was surprised. Because... They had told me that it wasn't going to happen. So in that happening, you know, I was like, okay, she's okay. She's alive. She took a breath. So I was happy about that. 
but the whole time I was pregnant, you know, I prayed for just one day with her. I didn't really care about anything else. I just wanted the day, you know, so I'm in the hospital and the doctors are coming to me and they're asking me all these questions and I don't know what the fuck to say. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to answer them because I don't, I don't, I'm 18. I don't fucking know, you know, and I've never been put in a situation like this. And there was a woman that was there that she was awesome because she had had a baby and had high risk and she had been through everything that was running the hospital and she was so I loved her so much she did so much for me but she wasn't there that day when I went into labor she came in after but you know they're asking me you know do you want a feeding tube do you want to feed her do you not want to feed her if you feed her it's gonna shorten the lifespan like they're telling me all these fucking things and I just don't know what to do so in all of this I say yes I don't want her to be hungry so they insert the feeding tube and I see tears come out her eyes and I'm holding my little baby she didn't look shit like me (laughs) because let's be realistic not many of my kids do um she was uh, pale really white she had black hair um, light eyes She looked a lot like her dad, you know, soft little baby skin. And, you know, I'm just holding her and I'm taking pictures and I'm just there. And our father's in the hospital with me and he's kind of in and out. He's in the room and then he's going out to smoke. And then he's coming back and he's going out to smoke. And mind you, I had literally almost to the hour, 24 hours with my daughter. It was maybe a little bit over. It was like two something in the morning that she crossed over. But, you know, I was happy because I got the day that I had been praying for just to be able to be there and to meet her because I was terrified I wouldn't be able to have that. And I had to know that I gave my daughter every possible opportunity. I had to know that I gave her every opportunity to live. I had to know that I did my best. So I. I suffered like I said no if I have to do this and go through it then I'm gonna go through it so by the time the time came for her you know she had her first bowel movement the sticky tar shit she did that and mind mind you I'm taking pictures of everything because this is the only time I have with her it's the only day and no matter how many pictures you take it's never fucking enough you know it's never enough so towards the end of the time you know I'm holding my baby and she's taking her last breaths she's she's gasping for air and I'm telling the doctors like she's having a hard time breathing and they're like no like she's taking her last breaths you know and she's gonna cross over soon so naturally I'm just I'm holding her and I'm just crying because (laughs) that was it you know I wouldn't be able to have her anymore I wouldn't be able to have any I wouldn't be able to see her grow up. I wouldn't be able to see her play or walk anything ever. So, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm trying to keep it together and I'm being strong and I'm doing everything I need to do. And her father's stressed all the way the fuck out. And, you know, the doctor checks her heartbeat and they told me, you know, she's crossed over. So I make a mold of her hand and I make a mold of her foot, which I still have to this day, you know. I have the clothes that I bought for her, her diaper bag, the teddy bears that were bought. You know, my family was there, my brothers, my sisters, my mom. They all got to meet her and hold her. And, 
you know, it was something that was very difficult, very difficult, especially at 18 and you barely lived your fucking life. So all of those things happening. Now it's time to figure out what I'm going to do with her body. And mind you, I'm still recovering from giving birth and like all of this within the 24 hours shortly after I gave birth to her you know they're trying to discharge me and send me home so I decided I was going to cremate her because I was in the military and I didn't know where I was going to or like my final destination was going to be and I didn't want to leave her somewhere where I wouldn't be able to see her so I had talked to them about cremating her so, you know, and the worst feeling was leaving the hospital. Because, you know, you're leaving, your belly's still a little swollen, you're getting pushed out in a wheelchair, and you have to get up, and you have to walk out, and all the people that seen you pregnant, and all the people that knew you were having a baby, that didn't know the situation, and what you were going through, and the fact that you lost your baby, now are asking, how's the baby, and what happened, what's going on? And you're sad. You don't want to talk to these people when you don't want to sit there and see everybody else going home with their babies. You know, except you. <laughs> so, you know, um, I go home and I'm just sad, you know, and I'm laying down and they're telling me I need to take my medication and I need to do this and my mom's like overly worried about me but at that point I feel like I had shut down like there was parts of me that I just shut down I pushed that shit all the way as far down as I could so that I can function and still live <laughs> you know, so my mom's doing her best to make sure I'm getting the care that I need and she was broken herself, she was very broken but I, we have a service for her at the hospital. Now I'm grateful for the woman that was there. I wish I could remember her name and just tell her how appreciative I am of her because if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have got my daughter's footprints. I wouldn't have got a lock of my daughter's hair. There are so many things that I wouldn't have gotten because of that woman and I am very grateful for her. Because the rest of the fucking military staff was horrible. They were just, they didn't know what was happening. You know, they were just, they were not prepared. And I understand that, but come on. It's not every day that this situation happens. So if you had a team, you should have called them in. So I'm in the, the chapel. We go to the chapel to have the service for my daughter. Now people from the military that I knew that I was working with that were with me when I first got recruited and went in and my immediate family members were there and we're there together these people give me my daughter's body to hold so I'm holding a cold dead body of my baby for at least an hour and I'm mourning her and I'm crying and I'm going through all of these fucking emotions because I don't know what the fuck's happening and I didn't know that it, it was not fucking normal to sit there and hold your fucking baby after it's passed over I didn't know so I'm doing all of this unaware and like I said my tears just constantly flowing constantly flowing because at that point I just couldn't stop fucking crying and that was the last time you know I was gonna look at her face but she looked so peaceful you know she just had a little grin on her face and she was so at peace so after that you know they go they put her back in the morgue and then I have the people for the cremation services come, you know, I pick out her urn, I do all of these things. And, you know, then a few days later, they bring me back her ashes. Now, as all this is happening, you know, I'm waiting, I'm going through all this stuff. 
I am also dealing with my daughter's father and his baby moms, who he was still trying to have a relationship with and still lying about everything. So he was still having intimate relationship with me and telling her he was not. So she had my house number, she had my cell phone number. It was out of control. And the words that came out of this woman's mouth, if I could have went through the phone and punched her in her fucking face, I would have. Because this was literally, I think it was a couple days before I gave birth that she was like, why don't you hurry up and have the baby so that it can die? And I told her, when I see you, I'm going to fuck you up. And she's like, oh, but you're in the military. I was like, I don't give a fuck. The military is not going to stop me from whooping your ass. So, yeah. That just, you know, this is just the type of things, you know, in lieu of dealing with my daughter and losing my daughter and knowing I'm going to lose my baby and all of these things. It pissed me off more that I had to go through the extra stresses of being heartbroken and lied to and betrayed and do all of these fucking things by myself as an 18 year old girl with someone I thought was my partner and he's just being deceptive so I was just suffering the loss of a child I'm suffering the loss of a relationship I was just suffering for fucking almost a year you know it was a lot and by the end of it his ex or girlfriend whatever the fuck she knew the truth because I was not playing that shit I'm like no you man enough to fuck me you man enough to tell her what the fuck you're doing because she just she didn't believe me so I made him tell her and by made I mean I ended up hitting him with the fucking brush upside his head because he pissed me off because he kept lying I typically don't gravitate towards violence I try not to but there's times it's necessary <clears throat> so I uh, did all these things you know it was a horrible situation, but this was, you know, it just, I think about this because this is, September is a difficult month. You know, right now, yesterday was my daughter's birth, today was the day she crossed over, and on the 15th is my mother's birthday, and my mother passed last year. So, it's a difficult fucking month for me, and I'm trying to keep it together, but I feel like it's important because people don't understand the battles that people go through. People don't understand the suffering that people go through you know just because I look happy and I try to be peace love and light all the time and I push forward and I try to uplift and encourage other people doesn't mean I didn't suffer I suffered a lot and it's horrible when people don't have the compassion to understand what it is to lose your child I lost two of the most difficult people to fucking lose in your life. You lose your child, which is fucking impossible. You'll never get over it. And I lost my mom. And it's hard because those are two people that you should never experience the loss of your child. Like, ever, ever, ever. And then to have people say the harsh, horrible things that they say without any consideration is fucking horrible. You know, take a minute and think if that was you and how much pain you would be and how much you would fucking be crying and suffering before you say horrible fucking things to people. You know? And... There's people that have miscarriages and they suffer. I've, I've had miscarriages and it hurts just as much because you lose the hope and the anticipation of having that baby. So please, you know, and I share this because, again, a lot of people don't know this. <laughs> and it's in honor of her, you know, she would have been 16 years old today just to imagine what she would have been like. You know, but I know she's in a better place and I know it all served a purpose. But it doesn't make it any less painful. You know, it doesn't make it any easier to deal with. It's been years and look, I still have the same fucking reaction. But, you know, I feel like it's important to understand that people suffer in silence. People don't share this shit. People don't talk about it. People don't say anything. Especially when people have babies with 
and encephaly you know you know what it is to see your baby your baby's deformed and it's she literally from here from here up it was her brain her brain was open like that's what i seen it was there was no skull there was no nothing it was open so from here down like she had hair and she looked regular but everything else no it was not and it's so hard to understand it's so hard to accept it it was hard to acknowledge it especially when you have people that just kept telling you have an abortion it's easier have an abortion and no I can't you know I see my baby alive I can't kill my baby because that's what I would have been doing I would have been killing my child to make my life easier and that's not me I don't take the fucking easy road for shit I don't fucking care how much I have to suffer so I wanted to share her story today you know because I know there's a lot of parents that have lost a child and it eats away at you and it never goes away and you never fill that void because that's your baby it's your baby no matter if they're fucking newborns if they're fucking 50 it's your fucking baby it's your child it's something you gave life to and you gave life to it and you and you lost the baby like you felt it you felt their life leave them in your arms you know and it's a horrible feeling to lose your child it's a horrible feeling to lose your parent they're both very equally shitty fucking things and it's even worse if you would have had a longer if i would have had a longer more intimate bond with my daughter it would have fucked me up even more so try to be understanding of people <laughs> her name was liliana and I don't know, I just, I fell in love with that name. It was Liliana Elizabeth. Yep. And I don't, I, I went around a lot for her name. <laughs> I couldn't think about it. It took me a long time. But, you know, and I still have, like, I have her picture on my altar. I have her little footprint and her little hand molds. And I have her whole, like I said, I have everything of hers because it's just it's something that I hold close to me. You know, it helps me remember. And my memory is shot for a lot of y'all that know me. My memory is all fucked up and I'm very forgetful, but I can remember it like it was yesterday. I remember everything that happened, the fucking chaos. The, I remember all of it, you know. And it's just, it's hard, you know, especially when you have other kids and you tell them that, yeah, you did have a sister one day, you know, once upon a time, and this is how old she would be, and this is who she would be, and, you know, you explain that to them. So, just understand that people are suffering their own battles. People suffer in silence, and just because you don't know that they're suffering, just try to be nice, you know, be nice to people. Because people really are fighting shit that you have no fucking idea they're fighting. So if they're having a bad day, they're probably going through some real shit, you know? But I feel it's important because not a lot of people are aware of neural tube defects. They're not aware of encephaly. They're not aware of the shit that happens, you know? And some people just take, say, hey, oh, thank you, Jonathan. I know, I, I know. And that's just, that's what I tell myself, you know? It's just, it sucks because... You want them physically here and you can't have that you know i get it but you know i just wanted y'all to know that's the story of my daughter you know she's a beautiful little girl and my little angel you know she came to visit me for a day say hello and she's like nah fuck this world i'm out so you know but thank you guys for watching and please don't be shitty people it's not nice to be shitty to people you know, be honest. People don't need to suffer on top of already suffering and then suffer some more shit in between all of that shit. It's fucking horrible. So I love you guys. Thank you guys for watching. And I hope this helps someone in understanding what's really happening in people's lives and what it is to really lose a child and a member of your family that you care about dearly. You know, it's hard. So thank you guys for being there. Thank you, Lily. She is. She's in peace. She's in a better place. But I love ya. Have a good day.